Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar. If you're attending live, happy Valentine's Day. And if you're watching the replay, well, we're sending love to you too. Today's topic, debunking myths, OSHA, HIPAA, and HR uncovered is gonna be chock full of information, compliance rules you might've thought you knew, mistakes your peers are making, and common issues seen across the nation in healthcare practices. Today, we've teamed up with our partner in compliance, Abai. Your experts for today's presentation, we have HR for Health's Jill Hasselman. She is our SVP of Strategic Partnerships. And Matt Leatherman, he is the Lead Compliance Consultant at Abide. So for today's agenda, we're gonna briefly highlight Abide and HR for Health. We will go through the OSHA myths, HIPAA myths, and HR myths. Um, and then we'll do a live Q&A at the end. So throughout the webinar, please feel free to send in your questions through the chat box, uh, especially if you have questions on specific scenarios in your state, because there are different um, scenarios per state. And so we just want to make sure we get you the right information. And then also, if you want to learn more from either HR for Health or Abide, type the words learn more into the chat box as well. So let's get started. Um, a little bit about Abide. So like I said, they're our, our partner in compliance. They're a technology company specializing in HIPAA and OSHA education and solutions specific to the independent pra practice environment. Their mission is to revolutionize compliance. It's that simple. And HR for Health. So we've created a human resources software company to help bring efficiency and compliance to healthcare practices through payroll, timekeeping, employee scheduling, performance management, and HR education. So without further ado, I will kick it over to Matt to get us started with the OSHA content. Awesome, I appreciate the introduction. Um, excited to break down the requirements and really just the landscape of OSHA um, compliance here for everyone. Um, so you can flip over, yep, perfect. Uh, the OSHA Act, uh, it was signed into law in 1970. It stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration um, and really was there to ensure safe and healthful work conditions for workers by setting standards uh, and providing training, outreach, education, um, and assistance. Now, OSHA applies to all healthcare organizations, really with the main goal of reducing injuries and illness uh, and death within the workplace. Uh, and a very interesting statistic as it relates to the goal of OSHA, um, according to the US Department of Labor, deaths in the workplace have been reduced by 50% and workplace-related illnesses and injuries are down 40% since the establishment of OSHA. So obviously, very much accomplishing what it had set out to do. Now, in your OSHA compliance program, it's very vital that your, your program documents within the seven core elements of OSHA. All right, and just giving you a little bit of background on those seven core elements. The first one's management leadership. It really starts from the top down, right? Creating that culture um, with leadership, filtering it down to all of your staff. Um, and with that is, is worker participation. Your workers understand that they need to be involved in the process of making sure the practice is OSHA compliant. Um, and it's really vital that they feel that involvement from everyone um, within the organization. Hazard identification and, and assessment really involves your entire staff being comfortable reporting uh, different incidents or uh, hazardous areas, um, and then implementing controls uh, on those areas that have been identified. Obviously, education and training revolves around the OSHA training, which we'll dive into, um, and then evaluation improvement and really communicating and coordinating um, you know, with your employees those goals uh, of your OSHA program, okay? Now, um, with that, our really goal is to simplify OSHA compliance, right? And, and looking at it on an, in an auditor's lens, um, it's all about what you can prove when it comes to HIPAA and OSHA. Um, and that's really why our definition is it's so vital your practice can provide documented proof that there is a culture of compliance. And what I mean by culture of compliance is what you guys do on the day-to-day -day within your organization to create that work, uh, safe work environment. It's all about what you can document, right, as, as to how you guys provide that culture. Um, now, when we look at OSHA compliance, I think the important thing is looking at it in the view of an auditor, right? And when we do that, uh, we look at it in a puzzle picture, right? And just like any other puzzle, you have to have all the pieces for it to make sense in order for it to be complete, all right? And you have to have that full picture. Breaking these down individually, uh, the first piece to any OSHA compliance program is what's called a facility risk assessment. You may hear it be called an FRA. All right, and what this is really the first thing that OSHA is gonna look for in the event of an investigation. It's a self-evaluation, a self-assessment of your organization, identifying what hazards are in place within your practice and what controls are there to protect your employees. 
All right. Um, the important thing is that once you've identified those uh, areas of hazard, is that you're working to implement solutions on those areas you've identified. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you're updating your facility risk assessment on an annual basis. Um, and it's very, very vital that it's documented. Okay. And then what I like to think about this is think of it like just like you do a general exam for your patient. It's kind of a general exam of your practice as it relates to those hazards within your workplace. All right. Now, uh, the next piece is hazard mitigation. It's exactly what it sounds like, right? Hey, we've identified these areas that were vulnerable, and now we just need to work um, with our employees to implement solutions. And with your employees is very important. They should be involved in that process. They're the ones on the front line that see those different areas. So you need to make sure that they feel comfortable reporting um, or uh, communicating to you as to what those are, all right? Now, the third piece of that puzzle is OSHA training. You know, OSHA is very specific when it comes to the training requirements not only knowledge-based training, but site-specific, right? Your employees understanding exactly what they're going to encounter in the workplace. Um, the important thing is obviously that it's documented, um, that that training is being carried out, uh, and there's disciplinary actions for employees who don't do that training, right? So the important thing is that your staff is trained so they understand exactly what those risks are and you know how to be OSHA compliant within the practice. Now, programs, policies, and forms. Um, we oftentimes like to, uh, you know, I would like, like to correlate HIPAA and OSHA to taxes. Think of these like your 1099s and your W-2s in the tax example, those supporting, um, you know, OSHA documents, really telling the story as to how your organization is providing that safe environment. Um, a lot of the time, this is where you spend that uh, effort, you know, editing, drafting programs, policies, and forms, making sure that they're specific to your practice. And that's really an important thing. Three things that the government looks for these is that one, they're specific to your organization. Unfortunately, when it comes to OSHA compliance, you know, you can't just go out and purchase a binder and then it's one size fits all. You know, every practice operates differently and that's really why that binder needs to be specific to your practice. The second is that your answers in your facility risk assessment need to be based off of your, your programs, policy, and forms need to reflect the answers in your facility risk assessment. Those two documents should be a living, breathing document and should really tell the same story. And then lastly, just staying up to date with any federal and or state law changes if you have a state OSHA program. All right. And then an OSHA manual. Most practices I speak with, they understand this piece. Uh, you know, a lot of times they correlate to like a dusty binder, which is fine. Um, you know, sometimes it is a dusty binder. The important thing is that it's a living, breathing document, right? You should be really staying up to date. The way the government looks at like with this is they just look at it as an easily accessible area to keep your facility risk assessment, all your programs, policies, and forms, and any other OSHA documents. Easily accessible because your staff needs to have access to, to the, um, that documentation, okay? And then the last three, safety and health logs. Um, you know, having a way to document um, if there is an injury, illness, um, or an incident at the practice. Um, now, keep in mind that some uh, state-specific plans may affect who you report to or the time frame, um, but you'll want to make sure that you're documenting if any of those incidents happen. I think it really can help evaluate uh, the uh, effectiveness of your OSHA program. If someone's continuing to get have an incident on the same area, you know, it gives you a good idea that maybe we need to train them on, you know, uh, what they're doing on the day-to-day. And then an MSDS library, uh, SDS library, um, having inventory for all the hazardous chemicals that your practice uses in your environment. You know, for certain industries like food and beverage, et cetera, it's very standard, but a lot of times we see this as an overlooked aspect in the medical field. Um, you'll want to make sure that you have an SDS uh, library. With this, I always point out, one, your staff absolutely needs to have access to those SDSs. You'll also want to make sure that if you stop using a chemical, that you still keep it in your SDS library. Don't just take it out um, because, you're, because you're not using it. Keep inventory for all previously used chemicals as well. And then lastly is joint responsibility, okay? Um, you know, there's no particular requirement for your vendors to sign a joint responsibility form, um, but we recommend it's best practice that they do. Ultimately, what that means is if they come in, they have an incident, you don't want to be liable for it. It's ensuring that your vendors are, um, you know, taking their own OSHA compliance program serious. Now, I really want to just debunk uh, a few myths when it comes to uh, OSHA compliance. You know, many practices view OSHA compliance as uh, kind of trepidation, bogged down by fear. Um, but understanding the truth uh, can really transform your compliance program um, for being really, uh, you know, proactive uh, when it comes to the investment and employee safety. The first one is obviously on-site training, okay? The first myth that we oftentimes hear is needing an on-site third-party expert. Not the case that it's required that you need an on-site third-party expert. Um, there are site-specific requirements, which you can give that control back to your uh, OSHA safety officer with checklists, et cetera, um, but you don't necessarily need to rely on a third-party expert to carry out that training, 
okay? The second is my employees receive training, so they're all set. Uh, important, like we just flash back to those puzzle pieces, is there's more that goes into it than ju just OSHA training, okay? Um, yes, it's important that your staff's trained, it helps educate them, but there's more to compliance than just training. The second myth, uh, you know, doesn't apply to me. Now, my practice is too small, regardless of the size of your practice, OSHA still applies. Um, what I always like to say, it's really about providing that safe environment for your employees. You know, as we discussed earlier, it applies to all healthcare organizations. And in, in all fairness, over the last several years with COVID and the things that we've all gone through, it really painted a tremendous target on healthcare's back specifically. So very important, regardless of your size, that you're maintaining OSHA compliance. Uh, next is OSHA compliance is too much of a burden and really impedes on patient care. Um, I really like to think that OSHA compliance is a very big piece to patient care. Uh, you know, a safe environment for your employees and providing that also means it's a safe environment for your patients and visitors. Um, by having your employees be uh, involved in your OSHA compliance program, it empowers them uh, and makes them feel a sense of involvement and ultimately is going to help their engagement when it comes to the day to day. And then lastly is no hazard, no SDS. Um, no chance of a hazardous chemical. You know, it doesn't have to be some complex chemical that none of us can pronounce. You know, if your team uses it as a part of their job, ethyl alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, even cleaning materials or cleaning products um, used to sanitize between patients, you'll want to make sure that you have an SDS or a material data sheet for uh, that chemical. And then lastly, employees don't need to know where to find SDSs. Very vital that all of your uh, employees have access to that SDS. We always recommend in digital form. Um, I think that ultimately will help it keep up to date, easier access as well. So there's just some uh, several myths that we run into. Um, kind of a high level of ocean. We'll, we'll move into HIPAA. Um, you know, another very important topic. And I always like to, you know, ask practices, do you know what the uh, HIPAA acronym stands for? And a lot of times, majority of the time, they don't know the acronym. It's really a great example of how confusing HIPAA can be. But it stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Few things, obviously, it's been around since 1996. Enforcement's really caught up with the law from 2013 moving onward. Not a laws of laws are like that where it's enacted and then enforcement takes place several years later, really letting healthcare organizations catch up to the times. But following 2013 is really where a lot of those fines come into play, okay? Now, another one is that obviously there's been a lot of proposed changes to the HIPAA privacy rule starting in December of 2020. Important thing with that is we just tells us it's an act of changing law. The government has their sights on it. It's very mainstream and definitely something that all practices uh, need to be aware of. And the last part of that acronym is ACT, right? Making sure that healthcare providers take action when it comes to their HIPAA compliance program. Now, when it comes to HIPAA, there's no such thing as the HIPAA police. They're not going to come into your office, watch your day-to-day. It's -day. a very big misconception. Um, really, the HHS oversees uh, the whole thing, and then it breaks down into the federal agencies, the Office of, C uh, office of Civil Rights and then CMS, okay? And it can even go down further to the state level with the state attorney general, okay? Now, um, really interesting to note within uh, the divisions uh, for uh, the Office of Civil Rights, they're very much becoming more strategic with the landscape of our current climate when it comes to HIPAA compliance. They've changed their division from the Health Information Privacy Division, HIP, to the Health Information Privacy Data and Cybersecurity Division. Um, really with the OCR being more proactive and educating the publics uh, of their rights when it comes to HIPAA compliance, now is, it's very vital now is the time to make sure that you're being proactive when it comes to HIPAA compliance, okay? Now, just like we had done for OSHA, I think it's really important to understand a few misconceptions. The first one that I hear a lot is our uh, practice management or EHR uh, product is HIPAA compliant. You know, in truth, uh, your electronic health record system doesn't actually conduct a risk analysis for you, which we're going to get into those pieces. Um, you know, though EHR vendors can help you ensure, you know, that their products is HIPAA compliant, um, you know, they're not responsible for really uh, privacy and security compliance. Okay. And the uh, security rule, which we'll get into, accounts for all uh, electronic health records, paper as, or as electronic as well as paper records. Okay. Now, the second one is we don't discuss patients in front of others, or uh, and, and really I hear that a lot, and we'll get into, just like we talked about OSHA, yes, that's a great culture, but ultimately when it comes to HIPAA and them not coming into your office, it's about all about having that documentation. That's excellent that you you have that good culture and you know uh, employees understand when to say things, when not to say things, 
but just because you don't discuss patient's name in front of others doesn't necessarily mean you know the whole story to HIPAA compliance. Now, uh, we get patient authorization uh, and consent forms signed. As you'll see in a minute, it's an important piece to that puzzle, absolutely, um, but it's not the whole picture. Okay, and that really follows along with just we did our training. Oftentimes, the event of an audit, training may be asked for, but it rarely is it the only thing they ask for. Okay, so it's important that your staff is trained, but uh, you know it's not going to make the practice fully HIPAA compliant. And then lastly is our IT company uh, makes us compliant. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, yes, IT and, and those technical safeguards are very important, um, but as it relates to your physical and administrative safeguards that you guys have in place at the practice, um, IT a lot of times isn't going to account for those uh, areas. So it's important that your OSHA compliance per, or your HIPAA compliance program is comprehensive and not just as specific to the technical areas, okay? <clears throat> Now, just like we talked about for, for OSHA, really want to simplify uh, HIPAA compliance. All right, there's three main triggers to a HIPAA compliance investigation. One, you have a rise in patient complaints. There's a multitude of things that can happen under that umbrella. I've seen where practices delay in providing medical records, may be a disgruntled patient. I've even seen responses to online reviews trigger investigation. Um, the second are an increase in healthcare technology breaches. A lot of practices think ransomware, which is very valid ran into or uh, uh, I was doing a CE course and I, a doctor had shared his screen and all his patient information was on it. So it's something that we typically don't correlate with a technology breach, but something I've run into specifically. Um, and then the government can proactively audit. Biggest takeaway with triggers and kind of HIPAA compliance in general is it's all outside your practice's control, you know, whether you have a HIPAA audit. Unfortunately, no one's immune to those three things. All right. Now, when we kind of go through breaking down the pieces, you'll see on the left-hand side, the first thing that the government's going to look for in the event of a HIPAA audit is a documented security risk analysis. So imperative. And what this is, is it's a self-evaluation of your practice within your physical, technical, and administrative areas, identifying what safeguards are in place to protect your patient information. Okay. Now, I would argue that's fairly easy to do. What the government wants you to do is go a step further, however, and also identify areas where you're vulnerable. Where is there a potential compromising to that data? Um, where, you know, where can we improve when it comes to protecting that patient information? And once you've identified those areas, implement solutions or strategies or processes over time to mitigate those areas you've identified, okay? You'll want to make sure best practice that's done annually um, at the bare minimum once per year. The way the law is written is on a continual basis. Um, but with it being the first thing that the government looks for, it's so, so important that you have a documented security risk analysis within the practice. Now, we move into risk mitigation. You know, there's an important thing that I always mention with HIPAA compliance is it's an ongoing process. Rome wasn't built in a day. It's something, you know, your practice continues to work on and, and improve. Uh, but it's all the pieces coming together, and that's risk mitigation. Hey, we've identified where we're vulnerable, some areas we can improve. We need to implement solutions on those areas. I don't necessarily want you to think you have to do it all overnight. That's okay. What the government wants to see is just that you're continuing to prove progress. You know, maybe we don't have an encrypted email. We want to identify that in a risk analysis over time, implement solutions, and we'll document those solutions. That is what the government's going to look for. Okay. And then HIPAA training. You know, like I mentioned earlier uh, with the misconception, it is just one piece of that puzzle, but it's very important. Um, making sure your staff understands their roles and responsibilities when it comes to protecting patient information also helps protect your organization. But we have three, three best practice recommendations with training. Obviously, recommend it's in modular format with the quiz. Um, is that it's done annually for your existing staff. And if you bring on any new employees, you want to make sure that they're trained within the first 30 days. I always personally advocate train them before um, they have access to patient information. If you can make that a part of their onboarding process, it can help uh, relieve that. Uh, but it's really important that they're trained before they have access to information and obviously documenting uh, when that training has been completed. And then we move on to policies and procedures. This is really an important piece. And like I mentioned with OSHA compliance is where it's a lot of the time is spent for, for HIPAA. You know, is understanding and drafting, editing policies specific to your practice, comprehensive to HIPAA. Uh, but they really, just like that risk analysis is going to tell the government how you're protecting patient information, your policies is going to tell them how you're handling it. Okay. Three big takeaways with your policies and procedures. As really the important thing is I see a lot of practices go out and purchase a binder, uh, uh, you know, their templated policies. 
that's fine. That's a great starting point, but you'll want to make sure you go into those policies and then you amend them to be specific to your organization. No two practices function the same. And that's really why when the government doesn't come into your office, they just send an audit letter. Um, they need to see exactly how your practice is protecting and handling patient information. Okay. So specific to your practice, they need to be based off of your security risk analysis. Hey, we're changing our passwords twice a year. Let's make sure our policy reflects twice a year as well. And doesn't say four times a year because it's a templated policy. Okay, so as you mitigate a risk, both those need to be up to date and tell the same story. And then just uh, reflecting and current with all the federal and state laws. Now, uh, patient authorization, consent forms, uh, you know, a lot of practices that I speak to uh, typically do a good job of these and getting them signed. I always tell them, you know, if you have a formal process of reviewing them, you know, every two, three years, um, I always very important that any major life change, minor to an adult, marriage, divorce, obviously that information is going to be reflected within those consent forms. And then a HIPAA manual, um, you know, really a, a dusty binder is sometimes what practices talk about. But as I mentioned earlier, it's all about what you can prove and it has to be a living, breathing document for your organization. Um, the way the government looks at it, it can be in physical or electronic copy. And that's why they simply just put an easily accessible area to keep your risk analysis, your policies and procedures, and any other HIPAA documents. Easily accessible is very important because your staff needs to have access to those policies. Um, and with, you know, recommending it in electronic form, I think it's twofold. You know, God forbid a fire or flood at the organization, but also it can help your staff have easier access to those policies and they stay up to date in the electronic form. And then the last two pieces, one is a business associate agreements. Really an important piece, and oftentimes, you know, I speak to practice, maybe an overlooked aspect, but it's very vital that you have business associate agreements in place. What a business associate is, is it's going to be any third-party vendor who has access or potential access to your patient information. Common ones that we run into, IT companies, uh, if you have an EHR, um, you know, third-party billing, consultants, patient text reminders, uh, patient communication. Um, if they have access or potential access to your information, you'll want to make sure you have a business associate agreement in place. Um, it limits the liability on your practice. You don't want to be a breach or liable for a breach that your EHR has or IT. And that's exactly what this agreement is doing is offsetting the liability, making sure that those vendors ultimately are, are held to the same standards as it relates to, to uh, protecting patient information okay, and complying with HIPAA. And then lastly is keeping that up to, that risk analysis up to date. As I mentioned earlier, it's very, very imperative that you have a documented security risk analysis in place, but it's just as important that you're keeping it up to date. Where I see a lot of practices struggle is it can be a process to get it implemented is they do it comprehensively every year. And that can be a burden. You're doing a million things in and out of the office. What we recommend is just as you implement a solution, reflect it in your risk analysis. Keep it up to date on an ongoing basis. Two reasons for that. It's going to limit the amount of work you have to do because you are staying on top of it. And it's ultimately going to provide the progress throughout the year that's the, inevitably the government's going to look for. So i um, seen a lot of, a lot of organizations, a lot of practices have a lot better success handling it in that manner. Uh, but that's breaking down HIPAA notion and I pass the baton to uh, Jill. Thanks, Matt. I think as you guys will see, there's it's very clear why we partner with Abide because there are so many similarities uh, across this spectrum that is compliance, which is it needs to be ongoing management of keeping up to date with what is changing, making sure your team is aware of what's changing, having access to these things on an ongoing basis. And the the same is true for human resources. And so what we're seeing right now is the average cost for resolving an employee related claim is $160,000 for a small to mid-sized business. And this is not even to mention, you know, the time and the mental energy that it takes to deal with a claim and also what it does to the morale in the office um, because you're distracted as an employer, the employees know what's going on. And so what we're also seeing is that not only is this the average number that is being paid out, whether that's to the employee, legal fees, you know, court filings, things like that, but there's also been a 400% increase in employee lawsuits over the last 20 years. So unfortunately, this is becoming the new normal. And one of the reasons that this is happening is because practices, I think, have become accustomed to DIY HR approaches. And not only does this leave the practice at risk, but on average, a practice owner tends to spend 120 hours on manual HR tasks a year. 
And so if we look at where the biggest areas of concern are when we see a practice's risk, this is kind of the buckets that it falls into. And the reality is it's really hard to maintain yourself as being up to date with all of the changing laws and how this impacts the different areas of your HR, also HIPAA, OSHA. And we realize that it can be really overwhelming and that these risks lead to not only really high dollar amounts in terms of claims, but also wasting valuable time and money trying to keep track of what's happening. So what we wanted to do is break down within these buckets, what are the most common things that we see? Because not only does HR for Health have a software, as Taylor mentioned in the beginning, we do pair that with HR advising. So our team gets calls every single day with these issues that we are helping to guide them through. So we wanted to break down what are the most common things that we're seeing. And so the first one is regarding hiring and onboarding. So a lot of doctors think I don't have to pay my, my employees for the time it, it takes to fill out their new hire paperwork. And it might not even be like a conscious decision. Like it could be really tempting if a new employee says like, don't worry, I'll fill these out while I'm at home. And then that way I'm ready to work right when I arrive on the first day. And the employee might mean well, uh, but the reality is they must be paid for this time. So once it, they are a new hire, they are considered an employee. So they do need to be paid. And just as a side note, what Matt was mentioning about the training time, that all falls into this too for HIPAA and OSHA to make sure that your employees are on the clock when they're working through that. So we don't want you to fall into the trap of like lunch and learns where, oh, they're, you know, I'm giving them lunch so they can go through this, you know, while I'm feeding them. They do still need to be paid for that time and same with when they sign the documents. So what we recommend is to set an hour aside on an employee's first day. And so right when they arrive, they know that they need to review and complete all of your documents and just making sure that they do clock in before they start to do that. Um, also a note here, just making sure that all of your employees are clocking in and out. Um, it's very rare, even if you're paying an employee on a salary basis, it's really rare that that employee in your office will be an exempt employee, meaning they're exempt from rest breaks, meal breaks, overtime. You really want to make sure that they are clocking in and out. So the only person in your office usually that is a non or an exempt employee is a true office manager. So somebody that manages more than one employee, has hiring and firing decisions, you know, can make, can work autonomously on business decisions. So just as like a reminder to everybody, making sure that you do have your employees clocking in and out um, because most employees will be considered non-exempt. So if you have questions on this, we know it's a really complicated kind of spider web. Um, we can help you to kind of do an analysis if your employees are exempt or non-exempt. But just making sure, you know, err on the side of caution, assume they're non-exempt, make sure that they're clocking in and that they go through and fill out those documents. It's really a one-time thing where you have them do that on the first day and then they are ready to hit the ground, ground running after that. So the second myth that we see is uh, that employees only have to sign an offer letter or W-4. Those are the documents I have to give them. And sometimes we see a variation of these. Um, we actually did some surveys and through our own research, we found that on average practices are giving three to four new hire documents when they onboard somebody. So that's usually an I-9, W-4, maybe offer letter, direct deposit sometimes in there. Um, but the reality is that there are 12 to 15 documents that employees need to sign on their first day that they're employed with you. So this is going to vary per state. Um, we do have you know, some states that are pushing 20 documents at this point. We have some that are less than that. But just know that on average, there's about 12 to 15 documents that they need to have. Um, and also, there are documents that we highly recommend that they have. So one that we listed out here, release for use of photos and likeness. This is something that you want your employees to sign if you're going to be taking pictures of them, posting it on social media, you know, sharing it on your website. These are this is a really important thing where they are giving you permission to do that. 
And also using that if they leave the practice, you know, if you haven't taken down those pictures or whatever, this release allows you to be able to do that. So thinking about, you know, those highly recommended documents, another example, an offer letter is not mandatory, but we highly, highly recommend you have that so that you're listing out all of the expectations uh, for their employment, what they're getting right when they start. Um, and something to note here too, is that as I mentioned at the beginning, laws are changing constantly and these documents are changing as well. So you really wanna make sure that you're staying up to date on what these documents are so that you always have the most up-to-date ones. So and the I-9 was changed last year. They uh, consolidated it to make it a little bit easier to fill out, made it a little bit easier if somebody is remote for you to e-verify that they're authorized to work in the United States. But the issue is, the government isn't calling you to say, hey, there's a new document. And there's also, you know, not really one place that you can go to find a list of all of these documents. So it is something that's tough to stay up on. Um, as a reminder, HR for Health does this for you. So we provide all the onboarding documents. They're electronically sent to an employee, electronically signed. And then we update those for you as laws change. Um, but just keeping yourself aware, again, they need to be paid when they're filling out these documents and that these are changing just as frequently as the laws, because usually a law changes that triggers a new document. Um, so definitely, you know, reach out to us if you have questions on this. We get asked a lot, you know, can you just send me the list of documents I need? And the reality, again, is that these are changing. So we can't guarantee if we sent you a list today that that's valid tomorrow. So. Just keep your ear to the ground, subscribe to our blog, whatever makes sense for you, just to make sure you're aware as these things are changing. But first and foremost, having three to four new hire documents, having anything less than eight, 10, 12, 15, depending on where you are, is something that is definitely a trap. So spending some time to make sure you're updated on this is absolutely worth your time because some of these documents do have fines associated depending on what it is if you don't give that to the employee on their first day. Another myth that we, myth that we see is uh, manipulation of time or asking employees to clock out for their breaks. And so standard across the board, regardless of where you're located at the federal law, it does say that if any time is taken for a break that's between five and 20 minutes, that they do need to remain clocked in for that time. Um, and this does vary by state. So there are state laws that require rest breaks. Um, about roughly half the country, half the states have some sort of state specific rest break law. Um, and if you have questions on this, like I mentioned, please put it into the chat. Our team can reach out and get you your specific requirements. Um, but something to also note here too is it's not just straight up rest breaks that you have to look at. It's also things like if your state has a lactation requirement and requires you to allow them to be clocked in to be doing that. So just really being up to date on what your specific law is, but you, as a general rule of thumb, you do not wanna make them clock out unless it's something that's over 20 minutes. Now, something that we have developed to help with this is we do have an employee scheduler that we launched last month. And what the schedule does is it allows you to schedule meal and rest breaks for your employees so they know when they're supposed to take that and they you know there's no question they stay clocked in for that time if it's a meal break anything you know that's typically 30 minutes that also varies by state of course um but if they if it's a 30 minute lunch break they can clock out for that so just making sure you know kind of the distinction between meal and rest breaks, what they need to stay clocked in for. Um, another thing that we do see that can be kind of a trap is if you do have rest break requirements in your state, lumping that into meal breaks. So let's say you have a requirement that you have to offer two paid 10 minute rest breaks a day and you go, all right, well, I'm just gonna give them a 50 minute lunch to combine those two 10 minute rest breaks and the 30 minute kind of standard lunch. You don't wanna do this. The rest breaks do usually need to be about two hours into their shift and 
at the first half of their shift and then two hours into the, the second half of their shift. Again, this varies, that's a general rule of thumb, but just making sure you're not lumping those things in together if you are required to offer rest breaks. So again, if you're using our employee scheduler, it's gonna make it really easy for you to do this um, so that the employees are aware and communicated to of when they're supposed to be taking those breaks or just creating a system yourself that allows them to know when they're supposed to take breaks. It's really clear to them that um, what your requirements are, what the state requirements are, that should be in your employee handbook as well. And we'll go into that a little bit further in a second, but those policies should be written out and there should be a transparent way for employees to see when they're supposed to take this time and not forcing them to clock out. Um, we do get clients that ask us, you know, they're really milking the clock um, and we, you know, they're taking too long of breaks. That is why you need a really strong policy in your employee handbook to address that. And then also a system that can verify for you of when you're scheduling those breaks, if they're not taking them. So it's just really about accountability and staying on top of this. And I know it can be a lot for if you have five to 10 employees even, and you're trying to manage all of their different schedules. So that's why we really recommend having an electronic employee scheduler so that it's really clear for everybody about what's supposed to happen and you're able to track if it's not happening. This is a huge pitfall that we see. We know that overtime is such an annoyance for our offices. We completely get it. We know that it's mostly a blanket policy in most offices that overtime is not either allowed to be worked or they need to receive like prior authorization if they're going to work overtime. But what happens is because a policy says we don't pay overtime, we see offices just going, well, we don't pay overtime. And even if your policy says you don't pay overtime, the law says that you have to. So first and foremost, please, please, please make sure you check your time clocks that they are not clocking employees out automatically if they're working over a certain amount of time. Um, those typically can be payroll softwares. Um, even if you have like a scheduling software that is not you know, specific to compliance and the timekeeping is, is tied into that, and it clocks them out if their schedule, you know, they're just working outside of their normal schedule. You definitely do not want to do that because what that leads to is an employee claiming they were for, forced to work off the clock. And that's the biggest trap because it's really, really hard for you to prove that you weren't forcing them to work off the clock. So instead, again, look at your time clock, make sure it's not clocking people out, but then also make sure that you have some sort of alerts around your timekeeping system and if employees are working overtime. Practice management systems are really common to use to clock in and out from. Again, the reality is like a payroll time clock, they're not necessarily looking at compliance. They're there to manage the patient information, scheduling, all of that. And the time clock is just something they add in. So those alerts aren't really baked into it. And so you, I would really, really recommend looking at that so that you're not falling into this trap of, you know, having that frustration if they're working into overtime, but not knowing it until you go to run payroll and then deducting hours or whatever it might be. So first and foremost, if an employee is working overtime and that is not authorized, again, pay them for that time, but write them up. That's a really big thing that I guarantee we see this all the time. The first time you write somebody up, the behavior usually stops because they realize that you're paying attention to it and you're not disciplining them. You're not trying to change the behavior by deducting from their paycheck. You are proactively communicating to them and documenting that. And again, you can you want to have in your employee handbook that they are not allowed to work overtime so you can use that policy as a reference when you write them up but just really really important it's absolutely a trap we also hear employees going hey i'm going to stay for an extra 30 minutes but don't worry you don't have to pay me overtime for that i'm choosing to be here late so we hear all those sort of things again it's a trap red flag do not say yes to this employees should be paid for all of this time and then you need to write them up to change uh, the behavior. Again, the good thing with our employee scheduler that I mentioned is you can actually see the total hours that you're scheduling your employees for minus meal and rest breaks, or I'm sorry, meal breaks. 
Um, so it'll take that time out if you're scheduling them for an hour meal break, let's say. But that way you kind of have that visibility of knowing. Uh, we have some offices that say, you know, my policy is we don't schedule employees for more than 37 hours in a week. So that leaves three hours buffer time for them to work up to those 40 hours if they have to stay late certain days or if they have to come in early certain days. And then the scheduler allows you to actually uphold that policy so you can see those total hours you're scheduling to really get ahead of this. Um, and then we also alert you every day if somebody is working overtime. So we send you a report each day, let you know who's still clocked in, if they worked overtime, how much, so that you're not waiting until payroll, you're not ignoring it altogether, you're aware that this is happening and you can have that discussion instead of deducting from their pay. The at-will conspiracy theory, as we call it, is easily the biggest trap uh, that people can fall into. So what at-will means is that you as an employer can terminate anyone at any time with or without reason, and then also somebody can quit at any time with or without reason. But the reality is this is absolutely a trap. Um, we hear so many clients or doctors that say, well, I'm at will, it's not a big deal. Or even worse, well, they're in their probation period. They have a 90 day time frame to prove if they are worthy or not to work here. And as a note on probationary periods or what we like to call introductory periods, that's not something that's written into the law. That's something that HR professionals made up for good reason, but to have that kind of period of where there's constant check-ins, feedback on how they're doing, so on and so forth. So really what needs to happen if you are ever gonna part ways with an employee is you really want documentation and justification for why you're parting ways with an employee. Because you wanna be able to prove if there ever is a claim for I was fired because I'm pregnant, I'm a woman, I you know am old, I'm this, I'm that, that you're able to objectively show that no, actually that's not why we terminated you. We terminated you because you were late eight times in one month and that's the reason why we parted ways. So having that documentation so that you're able to prove that um, and really termination should never be a surprise. If it's a surprise, we haven't done, done our job as uh, business owners, as doctors to make sure the employee has that constant feedback. And this also starts with giving your employees a job description um, so that they know what they're supposed to be doing in their job. And that continues on with things like performance reviews, having those constant check-ins. If you do have an introductory period, listing out what is going to happen within that introductory period. Are you going to do a review at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then actually following through with that to have that feedback through the performance review. And then outside of that, really documenting if they're violating your policies. Any sort of documentation needs to be as objective as possible. So as I use that example of clocking in late, again, clocking in early, that's a huge contributor to overtime if they're clocking in early outside of their normal schedule. Or if they're not showing up at all, if they're, if they're a no-show, having your employee schedule to be able to know when this is happening and documenting that automatically for you so that you can uh, hold them accountable. Also, these sort of controls do help to change employee behavior. So one example, we had a client who was going through beta for our employee scheduling feature and they had an employee. Um, so the scheduling feature knows if they're clocking in too late, you know, after they're supposed to start working, if they're clocking in early or if they don't show up at all. And so one employee came into the office one day and she said, you know, I was going to stop at Starbucks on my way in here, but I didn't want to get flagged for being tardy. So we can see that shift in behavior once they know that you're paying attention to it. And if you don't see a shift in behavior, again, you have that objective documentation that you can hold them accountable for. So this, again, biggest trap is this at will conspiracy theory. You really want to make sure you have that documentation and then it's justified of why you're going to part ways with them. So it's really easy for you to show that proof if there's ever an issue of why you terminated them. So you can get out of, you know, there's no wrongful termination claims, discrimination claims, those sort of things. And I always recommend if you're going to terminate somebody, please reach out to us so that we can help you to do it correctly. There are so many little nuances by state 
of what you need to be aware of. And so definitely just get help from either us, a legal professional that is, you know, an expert in employment law, not like your friend who's a real estate attorney. Um, you want to make sure it's somebody who knows what's going on, but just document, document, document. If you learn nothing else, that is going to be your best friend. Another myth with termination is being able to pay employees on their next payday for a final paycheck. So this actually varies depending on if an employee quits versus if an employee is terminated. And then this really does require by state or varies by state in terms of your requirements, meaning what is supposed to be included on the final paycheck. So things like vacation time. There are some states which require vacation to be paid. You don't have a choice. There are some states that don't require vacation to be paid out. And then there are some states that say whatever is written in your employee handbook is what you do. So, and then even further, if it doesn't state in your employee handbook that you pay out vacation or you don't pay out vacation, you have to default to paying them out because with absence of information, we have to lean to what is more beneficial for the employee. So there's a lot of variance around what needs to be included in that final paycheck. And then again, if somebody is terminated versus an employee quits, that timeline of when you have to pay them. So for some states, if an employee quits, you could potentially pay them on the next payday. But if you're terminating them, meaning you're letting go of them, you have to have that paycheck ready immediately or within two days. So if you have any questions on your state requirements, please put that in the chat. We know, again, it can be confusing, but just even having that awareness that this is not a one size fits all rule. There is no blanket federal rule that just says this is what you need to do. There are state requirements for this, depending on where you are. And then also a little tip on here. Um, once you part ways with an employee, you do have to get authorization from them to do direct deposit. So that's again in most states um, once they're no longer an employee them authorizing you to pay them through direct deposit ceases because they're no longer employed by you so having that being aware you most likely need a physical paycheck for an employee that is terminated um, and have that ready for them again this varies so please 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 reach out to us or put it in the chat if you have questions on your state requirements I know not all of you are sitting there ready to fire somebody. Maybe you are, but not all of you are. So just keep this in mind to reach out to us if you have questions. Um, and then again, the great news is if you're using HR for Health Timekeeping, we calculate that final paycheck for you. The, we know based on the state laws what's required of what needs to be put in there, how it needs to be paid, all of those things. So using a tool like that will help to eliminate the guesswork. So another myth about an employee handbook is that it only really needs to list out my employee benefits um, or PTO, or we hear variations of this. I don't need an employee handbook at all. The reality is yes, an employee handbook is not legally required. You, there's no law that says you have to have an employee handbook, but there are laws that say you have to have certain policies in writing. And this is, definitely more than benefits. So something that we saw in um, a lawsuit that happened last year, end of last year, was something called the Stericycle Inc. case. And so the deal with this was Stericycle found themselves at the center of a labor dispute because of its workplace policies and rules, aka their employee handbook. And the core issue of this was based on allegations of unfair labor practices and the employee handbook in question hadn't been updated since 2015 policies were old and the way that those policies were written was essentially perceived as protected activities for their employees were being you know outweighed by the way the policies were written so it was infringing on their rights for just the protected activities that they were allowed to have and so the, these certain policies address things like personal conduct, conflicts of interest, and confidentiality of harassment complaints. So what was ruled is that these were in violation of the rights of employees. And so what needed to happen was that 
these policies needed to be changed. And then there, this lawsuit now created a new standard of, around like what is unlawful to be able for employees uh, to be able to do and employers to be able to prohibit them from doing. And so what we want to look at here is closely monitoring these regulations, of course, and reviewing what your policies and rules are. So things to be looking out for and activities that could be considered protected depending on where you are. Things like openly, openly talking about pay and benefits, like employees being allowed to do that. Employees circulating a petition for better hours or a collective refusal to work in unsafe conditions. You know, that of course goes into OSHA. Um, and also understanding that social media expression can play a part in this. So one of the central components of the case was that the company's reaction to employees expressing their efforts on social media platforms. So there is that balance of freedom of speech, what employees are allowed to say on social media. So really going in and looking at what your policies are, reviewing things like confidentiality rules, your social media policies, and then as well as your disciplinary rules and policies that you have set forth. So that's just looking again, is it infringing on their rights? So this is an example of, this has nothing to do with benefits or PTO. This is just general rights that the employees have. And if your handbook doesn't even mention this, that's absolutely an issue. Your handbook should be looked at as, this is just the rules and laws of this office, of course, within federal, state, and local you know, requirements, but it should be from A to Z, how they are expected to behave in the office, dress code policies, your overtime policies. Um, and then of course your vacation and PTO is a very important thing to have in there, holiday pay, um, but looking at things like patient lists and confidentiality, as I mentioned, are really, really important to have in there, but making sure it's not infringing on their rights. So another, myth that we hear i can just update my policies at the start of the year i think the reality is a lot of people aren't doing this anyway but even once a year at this point is at times not good enough so really the employee handbook should be updated whenever laws change you know with the example of the stericycle case this is that was a handbook that hadn't been updated since 2015 and that you know this law that went into effect based on the decision of the case, that was at a random time in August of 2023. So these things can happen throughout the year and you really want to make sure that you are updating your policies. And then the other thing is that you want to make sure you're using your employee handbook. So what your policies say should be what you are actually doing. One really common thing that we see when we start working with clients is we go in, we do their employee handbook for them. And then what we do is we take those uh, time off policies that are written in the handbook. So PTO, sick leave, vacation, holidays, all of those things. And we set them up in the system so that they can be tracked. We want exactly what is mirrored, you know, what, I, what is in the handbook that's written for employees to get should be mirrored in what they actually see for their time off. And in that process, we see a lot of discrepancies and confusion from offices where what they have written down is different from what they want to set up to be tracked. And so we have to work with them to go, all right, well, this is what's written. So do you want to change what's written or do you want to change how we're tracking it? And we see these, these misconceptions a lot of, again, what is written down isn't actually what they're doing. And then employees, just like Matt was saying about the ocean HIPAA side, employees should have access to these policies whenever they need to. So we don't want a dusty binder. Uh, we hear that too on the, on the employee handbook side. This is a living, breathing document, just like Matt was saying about OSHA and HIPAA. So this needs to be updated in real time and employees should have access to it whenever they might need to. And the great news is this also takes an administrative burden off of you because now an employee can go in themselves and see what their policies are instead of asking you, you know, hey, I just got summoned for jury duty. What am I supposed to do? They don't have to ask you that anymore because they can go in and see your handbook policy of what they're supposed to do if they get triggered for jury duty. So definitely not something that you want to, uh, you know, leave to the wayside. And please, please, please make sure that your employee handbook has been written by a professional that is in the healthcare space. Payroll companies, you know, they're writing handbooks for 
dry cleaners, you know, nail salons, any sort of business, you want to make sure it's specific to healthcare because we are a unique niche within employing our employees. So make sure it's specific to you. Don't use your friends. Make sure you're updating it and all will be well here. So I'm going to kick it back to Taylor for us to go through questions. I'm not sure. I mean, we have about five minutes, so I guess we could go through a couple. Yes, we have uh, um, some questions rolling in. I want to make sure also we get to our resources at the end of the webinar. Um, but let's see. The first one we have, are associate dentists considered W-2 or 1099 if they are part-time or full-time in California? Yeah, fantastic. We could do a whole webinar on this, and we actually <laughs> are working on that. So uh, stay tuned for more on that. So it. it whether somebody is a 1099 versus W-2 does not have anything to do with if they're full-time or part-time. What it really has to do with is their, their job duties and really how much control they have. So it, just generally speaking, an independent contractor is considered somebody that can make their own schedule, brings their own tools, resources to go into an office. They are able to decide when they work. So in California, there this this does come down to state specific stuff. In California, it's much more strict around associates being independent contractors. But where you usually are okay if somebody is an independent contractor is if it's like a specialist that's coming into your office. They're doing something completely different in terms of treatment of what you're doing. They're scheduling their own patients. They're making their own schedule, and they're just coming in to add an extra layer of treatment that you might not do it's usually okay for them to be an independent contractor. Um, but I would highly, highly recommend um, you talk with our team to make sure so we can help you to decide. Because the thing with independent contractor versus W-2 is not only is there employment laws around it, but then the IRS also cares because you're paying taxes in a different way if somebody's 1099. So there's two agencies that you know really care about this. So it's really important that you get it right. And it, it can vary, but usually if they're just a general dentist that's coming in, they're most likely not a 1099. You would want a W-2 then. Thanks, Jill. And then one for Matt. Um, one of my patients had a wrong number in their chart, so our front office manager left a message for the wrong person. I thought this was mm -hmm. a huge HIPAA violation and we no longer leave names or other identifying information in a message. Is this right? Are my voicemails violating HIPAA? Yeah, if you have, what, that would be considered a breach. Um, the important thing is that you're logging that breach accordingly. Um, there's some specifics around reporting, uh, if that's an incident. Now, um, obviously it's under a certain amount of individuals affected just being one. Important thing is that it's documented within a uh, breach log that that did happen. And then if there's an incident that, that uh, corresponds or uh, repercussions around that, somebody complains, you have that log that, that you recognize that there was a potential breach occurring on that end. Documentation is huge there. Okay, awesome. So we do have a few more questions, but I want to get to the resources. So the other questions, we will follow up with you guys um, after the webinar. So we have a couple resources here. The first being our nine common HR mistakes white paper. So again, this is going to cover some of the things that Jill talked about today um, and go dive a little bit deeper into some of those scenarios too. So go ahead and scan this QR code to get that download. Um, and then again, after the webinar, we'll send the recording and we'll send these slides out as well. So um, if you can't quite catch it right now, uh, you can get it after the webinar. And then next from Abide, we have, um, if you want to check your HIPAA compliance grade, go ahead and scan this QR code. Um, you can take the challenge to see what your grade is and little bit, learn a little bit more on that portion from Abide. So thank you guys for attending. This was a really great webinar. Matt and Jill, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us. Um, if you have any more questions, you can go to hrforhealth.com slash abide um, and get some more resources there or schedule a demo with our teams. Um, again, we'll follow up with you shortly, but thank you all for your time and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yep, thanks. Bye.